The roller coaster ride when it comes to oil and gas prices may continue. There's a warning that Saudi Arabia and other OPEC nations could cut oil production once again. To talk about this in more detail is our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari joining us once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, the threat from OPEC has to do with Iran and economic dysfunction? Yeah, well, Saudi Arabia and OPEC in this case know that they uh, have, you know, the upper hand. They have the, the world <laughs> um, really in their fists and they can do whatever they want. I mean, so much for Biden's trip out to the Middle East uh, to try to convince perhaps Saudi Arabia to uh, put out more oil to kind of balance the uh, global infl in inflation and supply. And obviously the price of gas here in the West is astronomical. Um, um, and uh, we're up against an election in a couple of months. So um, it's always nice to bring down the prices in order to get people happier at the uh, polls. Um, but Saudi Arabia says no dice. Uh, we're going to even cut production because we know that we control everything. You know, And the message to the White House is we don't like the Iran deal that you're going to go forward with because you are putting more terrorism in the region. You're giving our enemy, uh, remember the Sunni-Shiite divide in, in the Middle East between Iran and, and Saudi Arabia. Arabia. Uh, you're giving our enemy millions and eventually a billions of dollars uh, to put back into uh, terrorism. And uh, since we have the upper hand on oil, then we're going to cut supply. And that's the threat right now. Israel's defense minister says the revived nuclear deal could see Iran armed with a nuclear bomb by the year 2031. Lisa, can you explain how that could happen? Yeah, well, um, let me back up a bit. Our own envoy, the U.S. envoy uh, to the Iran nuclear deal, meaning the person who's been entrusted with negotiating the deal is Robert Malley. He came out a month ago and said that um, if we let Iran go, they, they have the capability of, of having a weapon in a week. He, he said literally a week. Uh, as we're getting closer to striking a deal, they're saying, a month. Um, now, I mean, 2030 is actually a long shot, but the, the point being that there will always be this sunset clause. Whether we get into a deal with them or not, they're very close to uh, getting a bomb. Now, the only thing that they have not been able to get is the delivery system, and that is something that they can get in a short period of time, and that's the point, that they have been able to laterally grow their program. They've been enriching uranium at a very rapid speed. They have been uh, shutting off the cameras, as, as we have talked about before. They have been uh, denying access to IAEA inspectors. That is the UN's uh, nuclear watchdog group. Uh, and so, yes, we have no control over them and their um, desire to have a bomb. And that's exactly the point. And that is what Israel is warning. A lot of the moderate Arab states are warning that. A lot of Republicans and Democrats are warning that this is not a good deal. New intelligence from both Germany and Sweden says Iran's regime allegedly sought out technology for their nuclear weapons. Tell me more about that. Yeah, and there you go. You know, the EU is very gung-ho on getting a deal. They actually put forward their own version of a deal in order to uh, tie, you know, the Iran regime to some sort of deal. Um, as we know, for months, the, the West, the U.S. and EU, went into, uh, you know, deals and walked away empty-handed, walked into deals and walked out empty-handed, but they're no quitters. They've not given up on the dream of having an Iran nuclear deal. Now, reports are surfacing uh, from these two European nations saying that, guess what? They have been been seeking out the delivery systems and more technology. Remember, uh, under Donald Trump, there was a very uh, targeted pressure campaign, which was sanctioning these aspects of Iran's um, uh, economy in terms of banking and in terms of technology and their ability to ascertain these um, the, the technology and the equipment for uh, the, their weapons program. So now that's exactly what they've been trying to do, work around that and trying to get the technology and the equipment needed to deliver a weapon. So much for a worthy uh, partner to make a deal with. Israel's prime minister is hoping to set up a meeting with U.S. President Joe Biden on September 20th, I believe, to discuss how the Iran nuclear deal would directly impact Jerusalem. Yeah, so this is when everyone's coming to New York for the uh, United Nations General Assembly, like they do every year. But this year is extremely sensitive. Um, not only is Iran's president coming, but it's the year in which there might even be a deal announced before we uh, get to the General Assembly. So um, Israeli leaders are trying to get the attention of the White House to say, please don't do this. This is something that we've had our eyes on for a long time, and we don't uh, suggest getting into a deal with, with Iran. Look, Israel has to fight this threat day in and day out. They are an arms 
arms reach away from Tehran. Uh, that is the threat that Tehran has made over and over again. The regime has said that they will blow Israel off the map. They call the United States the big Satan and Israel the little Satan. So they have access to the little Satan. Um, and because of that, uh, Israel is warning and trying to get Joe Biden's attention to tell him to please not do this. But it's been very difficult to get uh, a, a, the an appointment, a phone call, whatever, uh, you, you know, can kind of uh, uh, have some sort of communication between the two leaders so that they can convey the message. But I'm sure Joe Biden knows exactly what Israel wants to tell him. So, Lisa, what were some of the biggest reasons why then U.S. President Donald Trump walked away from the Iran nuclear deal? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, if you want to juxtapose the two, two, the two presidencies, um, Donald Trump campaigned on pulling out of the Iran deal that Barack Obama got us into in 2015. Joe Biden then uh, campaigned on getting us back into the deal. The reason why President Trump walked away, that was May of 2018, uh, he said this is a deal that means nothing. We have no a way of holding Iran accountable for the fact that they are moving forward with their weapons program and we should be holding them accountable. So, um, and, and just to kind of, again, put things side by side, as soon as um, President Biden campaigned for uh, put, going right back into the Iran nuclear deal, uh, and, and obviously the type of liberal foreign policy that he actually uh, showcased as he was running for presidency, uh, Iran outlets that are tied to the regime were actually for President Biden winning the election. Imagine a, a regime, a rogue regime that, that is inserting its in U.S. politics, knows all the nuances of U.S. politics, and is pushing for a certain presidential candidate. That should tell us a lot about the way that President Biden uh, reacted. And ever since President Biden became president, the centrifuges have been spinning uh, at a, a rapid, rapid speed. They put, they shut down 27 surveillance cameras. They denied access to the uh, surveillers, and so on and so on. But President Trump believed that we have no way of holding them accountable. And not only that the human rights abuses, the fact that they're exporting terror, they're giving money to Hezbollah and Hamas and the Houthis in Yemen, and they are inserting themselves in the war in Syria and in Yemen and in Lebanon, uh, and they're everywhere. And there's no reason for us to be supporting uh, this, this the, the, their terror uh, sprees, uh, and we should be able to put sanctions on them, which is exactly what the Trump uh, administration did. And let me tell you, it was extremely, extremely helpful, and we were able to curb them for the time being. Now, speaking of Hezbollah, the UN's Mideast Point Man is sounding the alarm about the terrorist group and the activity near Israel's northern border. There are apparently at least four border area firing ranges observed in southern Lebanon over the past few months. Yes, and that's exactly right. Hezbollah is a cancerous terror uh, entity inside Lebanon, which is being funded by Iran's regime. Remember, let me go back in the history a bit. In 1980, the Iran regime decided that they can make a terror group called Hezbollah, uh, which means the party of God, uh, in order to do its dirty work. So that's where this concept of creating Middle East proxies uh, via terror groups came about. Then you had Saudi Arabia that went forward and helped out with the uh, uh, starting out to Al-Qaeda to battle Hezbollah and not allow Iran influence to grow in the region. So now, of course, this threat is nothing new, especially for Israelis who understand that they are cornered uh, from the north, south, and the um, west in terms of um, Hamas and Hezbollah and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. And again, who is footing the bill? The Iran regime, the same regime that the White House wants to help fund and put, again, billions of dollars into their pockets to help fund more terrorism, more deaths, more bloodshed in the region. Speaking of which, violence between opposing militias has broken out in Libya's capital. Lisa, at least 13 civilians were killed and close to 100 people were wounded, according to the Libyan health minister. And a number of families were also evacuated from areas around the fighting. Yes. The, the sad part about this is that we haven't seen any sort of, we've seen it go, you know, kind of uh, wax and wane in terms of activity in Libya, but we haven't seen any sort of stability uh, since their so-called Arab Spring. And the sad part about what you just outlined is that these are in civilian areas, meaning that the terrorists and these terror entities are fighting each other um, in civilian areas. And it's always, you know, innocent families that are in harm's way and, and the casualties are all civilians. Uh, this is, you know, it's going to be an ongoing problem because they're they're having issues um, in a tribal society. You take down the dictator, and of course, more tribalism. And of course, in this case, 
terror uh, groups that are uh, interwoven on the ground. Uh, and, you know, again, they're going to have a very hard time finding a, a unifying voice, if that's even what they want, but even having peace and stability within these different areas. Lisa, fears are surrounding the possibility of a leak at Europe's largest nuclear plant as the battle intensifies between Ukraine and Russia. There are accusations now on both sides of rocket and artillery strikes. Yeah, this is, I mean, uh, we've taken our eyes off of uh, what's going on in, in Ukraine, and uh, it's been six months now. Um, but, you know, it, it, it intensifies and the headlines come out whenever there's a story like this. Obviously, they're um, in and around this nuclear plant. And obviously, we all know the scenarios that can play out and be horrific, horrific. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's, again, no off ramp for Putin and uh, he will continue going. And the Ukrainians believe that they can they can really hold hold him off. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the solution will be or what the de-escalation can be in this case, but hopefully the escalation will not involve uh, any nuclear material or uh, hopefully the people around that area can get out safely and um, really stay out of harm's way. This is a horrible, horrible story. Yeah, we don't want to see another Chernobyl happen here. Right. Now, you and I discuss in great detail the large number of migrants who are making their way to the U.S. border hoping to cross from Central America, South America, thousands of people in those massive caravans. Now, there are reports that since the beginning of the year, 25,000 illegal immigrants have been detected crossing the English Channel, hoping to reach the United Kingdom. Right. Um, well, I would say that the, uh, the the European nations are experiencing something in, in a domino effect of what's going on in the United States. But I will say that the Europeans had this uh, influx of migrants before the United States started having their caravans. Uh, in the aftermath of the Arab Spring, uh, places like the UK and France and Germany and other places saw such a huge influx of migrants. And I will tell you, they have buyer's remorse for having such lax policies and allowing these migrants to come in unvetted. We've had terror attacks. We've had car rammings. We've had school bombings. We've had bombings in concerts. Um, so I think the Europeans, and one of the reasons for Brexit wasn't just the economic uh, incentive for the UK, but it was also uh, the lax policies of the EU that they wanted to get away from in terms of migration, in terms of allowing these migrants to come in unvetted, and the national security risk that it was posing uh, for for the Britain. So I think that they will have probably a harsher stance, if I had to guess, but the numbers are astounding. The fact that there are 25,000 lined up and are, are trying to come in and have, you know, um, basically made up their minds to make this trek, it's going to be very difficult for to, to stop them, but perhaps the UK can come up with a system of vetting or, uh, you know, something where they do not repeat the, the, the mistakes of the past decade in terms of allowing this national security risk to uh, prevent and what's the latest with some of the illegal immigrants trying to cross into the United States as well? Well, yeah, this we have a it's a crazy story of hypocrisy, Hal. Uh, we have uh, obviously almost 500 uh, migrants a day coming into certain parts of our poorest border in the south. Now, Greg Abbott, who's the governor of Texas, has taken a very bold move in busing these migrants to places like Metro uh, D.C. and New York City. Uh, and New York City and D.C. are, are all upset about it. And uh, the mayor of D.C. actually tried to call in the National Guard twice and was denied by the Pentagon, um, of course, because these are the bluest cities in our nation who are all very pro uh, open borders and, and, and uh, you know, want these migrants to come in. But when they stop at their doorstep and they have to absorb them, then they get upset. There's also all kinds of um, ideas like putting them up at luxury hotels on, for the time being. And uh, of course, residents in these uh, upscale neighborhoods are very upset by it. But again, it goes to show that, you know, if it's not good for you, it's not good for your neighbor or neighboring state or a southern state. Um, and uh, the sheer number of people coming in, let alone the risk of, you know, drug trafficking and human trafficking and the children that are getting uh, lost and abused and, you know, the, 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 the unknown, the national security risk and, and all the bad guys trying to embed themselves. Um, we're all for immigration, but legal immigration and not illegal immigration. Immigration. And that's really what the U.S. is dealing with right now. The sheer number of people coming in makes it impossible to vet them, makes it impossible to prevent disease and drugs and all other, uh, you know, nefarious things from coming in. So that's what we're dealing with at the moment. Foreign affairs expert and political reporter Lisa Daftari, thanks so much for joining us today from Los Angeles. My pleasure.